Yeah, hi, welcome back everyone. I think in the last lecture, we actually stopped on this slide. Uh, I hope you have attempted to do the exercises. Um, if anything was not clear, please let us know in the comments below. Uh, so today we're gonna be continuing our discussion about matrices. Uh, before, and I think this might be one of the last lectures on matrices, uh, and then after that we can jump to calculus and back propagation and so on. Right, so uh, we, we spoke last time, if you recall, about how we multiply matrices together, right? So we said that if you have two matrices and you would like to multiply them together, uh, then you have to be careful that the uh, number of columns of the matrix A should be the same as equal to the number of rows. The result will be a matrix, and then each component in that matrix is an inner product between the row, the corresponding row. So if I'm talking about Cij, I take the I, throw from matrix A, J throw from matrix B, and then I compute the uh, product. Uh, now, please notice that, uh, yeah, I mean, if this is not clear, please go back to the previous lecture where we described how we do the multiplication. And then we have actually applied this uh, to neural networks, right, like where we had two layers and then we showed uh, that a forward pass before the nonlinearity could actually be written as a product of this, ma this matrix with this vector. Now, notice that if I am going to compute an element in this product matrix, right, Cij, um, uh, uh, then what I need to do is each entry is going to require n multiplications uh, and n additions, right? Because, uh, because you need to multiply the i row by the jth column, so there are n of them, and then you have to do n additions. So there, there are n squared entries in this matrix C, and therefore the total number of potential operations to execute here is order of n cubed. Uh, so when we write 2n cubed is equal to order of n cubed, what we are really uh, meaning here is this notation order. It means like, you know, it's less than or equal to some constant multiplied by n cubed, which is in our case 2n cubed. So uh, uh, the, the best theoretical algorithm that has been doing this is, uh, uh, is order like of n to the power omega, where omega is less than 2.37286. Uh, and uh, the previous result was the same, but, you know, 8, 7. So, so this is good, but it's a galactic algorithm, meaning that it is, um, uh, you know, only kind of applicable uh, um, theoretically. Now, the widely used uh, uh, practical algorithm is based on Gaussian elimination. Uh, that takes an order of n log 2 to the 7 uh, as number of uh, uh, operations we would need to do. Uh, and actually, I just put this slide here, you know, to tell you that there has been a very cool recent advancement in 2022 um, uh, from DeepMind, uh, which was able to discover a faster matrix multiplication algorithm. Uh, with reinforcement learning. Uh, so they were able to kind of find an algorithm which is order of n to the power log 447 of 47. So uh, this is a kind of a faster algorithm than the previous ones. Uh, and now if you want to kind of like uh, uh, do, you know, like uh, a multiplication of matrices, you know, you, you don't need to do it in this uh, naive way, uh, but you might want to use this latest state of the art algorithm. Uh, which was discovered, yeah, by DeepMind. And it's interesting because it was completely discovered with reinforcement learning, which is super cool. I mean, we can have a separate talk about this uh, algorithm itself, but I think this is really awesome uh, that machine learning can actually be used, you know, in order to help us find uh, better theoretical uh, um, uh, algorithms, for example, here in matrix multiplication. Right, so now let's talk about inner products between two matrices, right? So we have discussed the, how to multiply two matrices together. Uh, we have discussed how we add matrices together. Now what about the inner product between the matrices? So remember, right, uh, when we talked about the vectors, uh, we had inner product between the vectors, right? We used U transpose V, U transpose V, right? Uh, as my inner product, U transpose was a row vector, V was a column vector, right? 
Mm-hmm. And actually, if you remember when we talked about the product of two matrices A times B, every element there, C, I, J, was an inner product between the i throw and J column, right? Okay. Now, if I have two matrices A and B, right, how can I compute the inner product between those two matrices? So imagine I give you a matrix A, which is R M by N. So it has a table of real numbers. It has M rows and N columns and a matrix B, which is also N by M, uh, which is N by N. So it has N rows and M columns. And now the question is, can we compute the inner product between you know, this A and B, between these two matrices A and B? Remember my notation, right, A and B. So yes, we can actually compute the inner product between matrices. Uh, and the first way to compute that is via trace operator. So first of all, let's understand what the trace operator means. Remember, we discussed different operators, like the transpose operator, if you remember, right? So the transpose operator, if we recall, was taking row, making it a column, and was taking a column, making it a row, right? If we had these two matrices. So please go back to the first part of the series uh, to know about uh, 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 these uh, uh, you know, uh, vectors, and then the second part about the traces of uh, the transposes of matrices and so on. Right, so now what is a trace operator, right? So what's a trace operator? So the trace operator, if I give you a matrix G, right, which is R K by K, so I have a matrix G, uh, which has K rows and K columns. So remember when we have K, uh, uh, like the number of rows equal to the number of columns, we call it A square matrix, right? We, we, we've also taken that before. So now we have a trace, uh, or, uh, and so you have a square matrix RK by K, which is uh, K rows and K columns, and each component is real. That's what we understand the notation here to be. Now, what the trace operator will do is simply it will sum the diagonal elements in this matrix. Yeah, it's very easy, really. All it's gonna do when you apply the trace operator on this matrix G, right? All you're going to do is you're going to actually end up summing the diagonal elements of this matrix G. So you will have G11 plus G22. So that's the first diagonal element, then G22, which is the second diagonal element, then G33, which is the third diagonal element, up to GKK, which is the last diagonal element. So really, the trace is nothing but the summation of all the diagonal elements, GII. So summation from i equals 1 to k, so over the size, you know, of this matrix. Uh, and I'm going to just add each of those real numbers on the diagonal, so g i i. So, of course, you know, if you expand the summation, you will notice it's g11 one, one plus g uh, when i equal 2, it will be g22, two, two, plus when i equal 3, it will be g33, three, three, plus dot, 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 up to plus g k, k. So here's an example, right? So if you have a matrix G, which is in this case three by three, three rows, three columns, uh, and uh, now the trace operator here will sum one with minus three and with 21, right? So it will sum one with the uh, minus three and with 21. So I'm just summing the number, uh, sorry, the components of the diagonal. So that's the first diagonal of the matrix, the second of the matrix, and then the third of the matrix, okay? So that will give me the result. <clears throat> now, why did I introduce the trace operator, right? So I introduced the trace operator to tell you, yeah, that the inner product between two matrices is defined as the trace of the product A times B. So imagine you have a matrix A, as we said, Rm by N, and a matrix B, which is Rn by M, Right, so we have these two matrices. A, it has M rows and columns. B, it has N rows and columns. And now, uh, when I'm talking about the inner product between these two matrices A and B, that is simply defined as the trace of the A times B matrix. So in other words, when you do A times B matrix, you will get this new matrix C, right? And remember how we do the product, we did that in the previous lecture, right? So for the product, we need the number of columns of the first to be equal to the number of rows of the second, so which is N in our case, great, we can do the product. The result will also be a matrix, that matrix will be M by 
n. So it has the say it'll have the same number of rows of the first and the number of columns of the second matrix. And now the inner product between those is nothing but the trace of the uh, product matrix, right? So when A and B are multiplied, you will get a matrix C. We called it C before. And now you will take the trace of that matrix, and that's the inner product between the matrices A and B. All right? Simple. So we can take A and B. We multiply the A and B. We get a new matrix C. Then we take the trace of that matrix C, and that's the inner product. So in other words, the trace of that matrix C is nothing but the sum of the uh, uh, diagonal elements of the uh, uh, of the matrix C, which is the result of A and B, right? So A and B give me a new matrix C, then I take the trace of that new matrix C. <clears throat> right, so here's an example of this, right? So if you have a matrix A, and that matrix A in this case is made one, two, three, four. So it's made of four rows and two columns. And a matrix B, that is made of two rows and four columns, right? Um, now, uh, if we want to compute the inner product between those two, first of all, we're going to multiply A by B. And the way we multiply A by B is as we did before, remember, right? So uh, we will have to have uh, four by two by two by four. So that will be a four by four matrix. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then we 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 get the, every component here as the inner product of the ith column, uh, ith row of the first matrix by the jth column, right? So for this value here, you will get one three transpose by zero minus one. Then this term here will be one three. So the first row by the second column, the inner product, and so on. And now, uh, when, when you have this matrix A, if you are looking for the inner product of A and B, you just take the trace operator, meaning that you will sum the diagonal elements that are available inside this matrix. And then you will get the trace, and that's the inner product between these two matrices, right? So, uh, so that's, that's another way, uh, or that's one way to compute the inner product between two matrices A and B. I give you two matrices A and B, I tell you, What's the inner product between them? All you need to do is you need to compute the product of A and B, which will be a new matrix, and then you will be able to take the trace, sum the diagonal elements, and that would give you the inner product of these two matrices, A and B. Okay. Now, as an exercise, right, as an exercise you could do if you are interested, uh, uh, remember, in the previous lecture, we had an exercise that is, was saying that A times B is not B times A, right? So in a matrix uh, world, uh, when you multiply A by B, so you do A matrix by B matrix, A first, B second, right? That's not the same as you do B matrix by A matrix, so you do B first, A second. So this is very different than numbers, right? Like if you remember when you do numbers, right, If it doesn't matter how you order the multiplication right? So two times three is the same as three times two. But then in the matrix world, it's slightly, uh, it's not the case. So if you take A, multiply that by B, or take B, multiply that by A, they, you get different results. However, what you can show is that the traces are equal. So the trace of A by B is the same as the trace by of B by A. So as an exercise, try to show that, right? I mean, it'll be fun. And let us know in the comments below uh, what, uh, what 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 happened, right? Like, could you could you actually uh, show that, right? Uh, so so yeah, this is to say that of course A B. If you have A matrix B matrix multiplied, then that's not the same as B A multiply B first then A. But the trace operator, right? Trace the sum of the diagonal elements is the same. So the inner product is the same between these two matrices. So here's a hint how you could do it, you know, like uh, you can use the definition of the trace and then try to work a bit with how you order the terms of, uh, especially the diagonal elements in A, B, and B. Right, so we took one way to define the trace operate, uh, to define the inner product between the matrices A and B, right? So where we said, okay, if you want to have the inner product between the two matrices A and B, all I need to do is I need to compute the, the corresponding uh, C matrix, and then I'll take the trace, which is the sum of the diagonal. Now, another way we could compute that, right, is via, is via matrix factor, uh, vectorization. 
So, so the idea here is, okay, from the first lecture, we know how to compute the inner product between two vectors, right? So when we had a vector u and a vector v, to compute the inner product, we did u transpose, so we made that a row and multiplied that by v, which was a column, right? So we know how to do that. Okay, now can we think about a way to do that uh, uh, for a matrix by using this thing that we know, right? So is there a way we can actually use that we know how the inner product between vectors work, you know, in order to, uh, um, you know, be able to get the inner product between two matrices? Well, yes, we can. <clears throat> what we are going to do is we're going to introduce a, a operator which we call a vectorization operator. So the goal of this vectorization operator is to take the matrix and represent it equivalently in a very long vector. Yeah? And now once you have these two matrices represented in very long vectors, then to compute their inner product is really just computing the inner product between these two very long vectors. Right? So that's how we're going to think about the problem from this perspective. So we're going to say, OK, if I have two matrices, and let's say I didn't tell you, you know, that the inner product is the trace of A times B, right, which, which is, you know, what we did in the previous slide. Uh, another way to compute this, right, is that, OK, you can say, well, I know how the inner product between vectors work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to vectorize my matrix, make it a long vector somehow. And now if I have two long vectors, right, for matrix A transformed into a long vector, for matrix B transformed into a long vector, so if I have those, now I am actually capable of computing the inner product uh, by just using the vector inner product, which is U transpose V. So imagine, first of all, let's, let's introduce this vectorization operator. So let's go to back to this matrix. So imagine you have any matrix, right, so any matrix. And that matrix is, let's call it a G, it has N by M, right? So that matrix G is N by M. So it has N rows and M columns, right? So that's the matrix G. And it's real numbers, right? So it's made of real numbers, R, N by M. Now, a vectorization operator, which we're going to call VEC of G. So VEC of G is a vectorization operator. What it's going to do is that it's going to vectorize this matrix G. So what it's going to do is it's going to take this matrix G and make a long vector out of it, right? So the way it works, this vectorization operator, is it will take the first row in this matrix G, G11, G12, up to G1M, and then list them after each other. Then it's going to take the second row G21, G22 up to G2M, and then list them after each other in a vector form. And then it'll do the same for everything else, and then it lists the last row uh, uh, as well, which is going to be here GN1, GN2 up to GNM. So all this vector notation is doing is rewriting it, this table, yes, in just a vector form. The way it's rewriting that in a vector form, or like in just 1D array, if you will, right? This was a 2D array. Now it's going to be written in a 1D array, right? And the way it is happening is we're taking the first element, putting it in the first index of that 1D array, the second element, which is in the first row, second column. We're going to put it in the second index of that array uh, up to the last uh, uh, element, uh, which was in the nth row, mth column, is going to be the last component or the last index uh, put in the last index of that uh, very long array we have created. So here we can concatenate the rows. Or you could have equivalently done the same, but rather than, you know, counting in this way, you could have concatenated the columns, right? So you could have taken the first column, put it first. You could have taken the second column, put it second. You could have taken the last column, put it last, right? So uh, so you, you could actually concatenate the rows or concatenate the columns, as we just did, right? So you could actually take the rows and put them after each other. So this first row will be corresponding to the first set of indices in my 1D array. This second row will be corresponding to the second, and so on. Or I could say the first column corresponds to the first set of indices in my 1D array. Uh, the second column will be the second set of indices, and the last column will be the last set of indices. So as an example, imagine I have a matrix G, 
that matrix G is one, two, three by two. So it's a three rows, two columns. If I concatenate, uh, uh, if I transform that with the VEC operator uh, row-wise, then the first component of that vector will be one. Uh, the second component will be uh, two. The third component will be three. The fourth component will be four and five, five and six, right? So here I concatenated them row-wise. Uh, because I said, okay, I'm going to take this, put it in the first index, and then this in the second index, then the second row, this in this index, and four in this index. Or I could have done a column-wise concatenation, right? So I would have done one, three, five. So I've taken one, three, five first, then two, four, six, two, four, six, right? So there are two ways you can transform the matrix from its table form, i.e. the matrix form, into its vector form. You can actually concatenate them row-wise. So take the first row, make it in the first set of components, second row, second set of components, and so on. Or you can take the first column, make it in the first set of components, and so on. So we can concatenate otherwise, like in these two ways. Okay. Now, if we are interested now in the inner product between the two matrices, right, we have equivalently rewritten these matrices as vectors, right? So if I give you A and B, right, instead of having the matrix as a table, you could concatenate it row-wise or column-wise like what we did before here, vec G, right? And now you have VEC A and VEC B. So I could take the A matrix and just you know, concatenate it row-wise or column-wise. I can take the VEC B concatenated row-wise or column-wise, but please be consistent. So if you do A row, let B be row-wise. Uh, if you do A column, let B be column. And then the inner product between the two, two matrices A and B, which I could have done right by computing the product and doing the trace, it's now an inner product between two vectors, vec A and vec B, right? So I equivalently transformed my matrix from table format into a vector format, right? So now I have vec A, vec B, and I want the inner product between them. Well, to compute the inner product between vec A and vec B, we know how to do that, right? We, we took that before. It's vec A transpose vec B, right? So you make vec A row, you make vec B column, and then you multiply the, uh, you do the inner product between two vectors. So you multiply the first component by the first component of these uh, vectors, add to that the second by the second, and so on. Okay? Uh, so, so now we know how to compute the trace in two ways. The one we can, the one we can compute as just make the product A, B, right? A times B. Um, and then take the, uh, create the matrix C, and then take the trace of that matrix C, right? So in terms of computation, you don't necessarily need to compute the whole matrix C because you only care for its diagonal elements, right? So you, you might want to consider just computing your diagonal elements if you want to be fast in computation. Uh, or another way to compute the inner product, right, is that you can take the, vec the matrix A, transform that into a vec vector by using this vec notation, which can concatenate row-wise or column-wise. Take the matrix B, transform that to a vector notation, uh, to, to a vector by a vector operation like we did here, so which you can concatenate row and column-wise. And now at this stage, you can just do the inner product between two, vector, two vectors, which is just vec transpose A by vec B. And remember how we did the inner product. If you missed that, go back, please, to the first lecture, part one of many, which will tell you more about how inner products are computed. OK. Now, one extremely critical uh, a matrix or operation we need to know in matrices is about the inversion of a matrix. OK. Right. So, 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 so now we talked about you know how we do addition of matrices, how we do uh, product of matrices, how we do inner product about matrices. Two ways: trace of the resulting matrix C, vec vec, and do the inner product. Now we need to still talk about uh, one more thing, which is what we call the inverse of a matrix, and that inverse of the matrix is extremely important. So focus with me a little bit here. If I have a matrix A, right, um, in N by N, 
the inverse matrix is that matrix. So the inverse matrix is that matrix that if I multiply it by the matrix of interest, I will get identity. So imagine you have a matrix B, which is N by N. So imagine I have a matrix B, which has N rows and N, N, rows and N columns. Okay, so imagine I have that. Okay, now, so, so remember, this is a square matrix. Now, a matrix A, so a matrix A is called the inverse to that matrix B if when I multiply that matrix A by that matrix B in either direction, so A, B, or B, A, so if I multiply A from this side or A from this side, Remember, multiplication of matrices is different depending on the order, right? But for a matrix A to be called the inverse for a matrix B to a matrix B, if I multiply A, B, or B, A, I should get the identity matrix. Remember the identity matrix. We also did that in the previous lecture, right? So the identity matrix was this matrix which had one on the diagonals and zero otherwise, right? Like that was the identity matrix. Okay. So if you have a matrix B, right, and you want to uh, uh, find the inverse to that matrix B, what you need to do is you need to be able to find a matrix A such that if you multiply that matrix A by that matrix B in any order, A, B, or B, A, you will get the identity matrix. That's what we call the inverse of the matrix B. Okay, so if you have a matrix B, which is a square, and now you are uh, have, and you also have, or you found a matrix A, which is also square, this matrix A is called inverse. If I multiply A by B or B by A, I will get the identity matrix, right? Okay, so that's what it means for the matrix to be inverse. So if you have a matrix and you want to find its inverse, right, then you are looking for that matrix such that if you multiply that matrix by your matrix of interest in any order, you will get the identity, okay? So the idea here is we are looking for that matrix A <clears throat> such that if I multiply that matrix A by my matrix B in any order, A, B, or B, A, I will get the identity matrix. Remember, identity matrix, matrix 1 in the diagonal, 0 other. So that's the identity matrix, one on the diagonal, zero otherwise. And now, uh, now here, right, uh, only square matrices, right, will have, uh, can, sorry, might, yes, have inverses. So only square matrices. Non-square matrices will have something called pseudo-inverses, which we're going to describe in a second. But the square matrices might have inverses, and not all square matrices can have an inverse. So for example, this matrix 0, 0, 0, 0 is not invertible. Because if you think about it, whichever matrix you pick and you multiply by A, whichever matrix, right, you pick and you multiply by A from either side, you will never be able to get identity in a way, right? Because you're, you know, you you're multi, it's gonna be, you know, zero, right? Like you're gonna multiply the row by the zeros, you're gonna multiply the first row by the zeros and add them, the second by the zeros, and so on. So this cannot be inverted. Now notice, right? <clears throat> there's a property when matrices are invertible, and that means that the rows and the columns need to be linearly independent. And if you missed what linearly independent means, please go back to the first lecture. We talked about what linear independence of vectors means. So here, if the rows and the columns are linearly independent, then we could find an inverse to that matrix. So now imagine the following example. So imagine you have A, which is 1, 4, 6, 2, 4, 7, 1, 5, 7. And the matrix B is minus 7, minus 7, 6, 2, 1, minus 1, 4, 5, minus 4. So notice I listed this matrix row-wise and I listed this matrix, uh, I listed this matrix column-wise and row-wise. Remember, I can index in any way I like, right? Mm -hmm. 
Now, if I multiply A, B, I will get the uh, uh, identity, right? And now, uh, and now this matrix B will be, <clears throat> this matrix A will be the inverse of that matrix B. Now, the inverse computation is cubic in the number of entries in that matrix. There are multiple algorithms that can do that. One is Gaussian elimination or LU decomposition algorithms. So in general, uh, big matrices are very expensive to invert. But if the matrix has a special structure, we can invert it in a faster way. Uh, if it's like sparse or lower or upper triangular, or if it's symmetrically diagonally dominant, there are algorithms that we can actually use to make matrix inverses very, very fast, or at least faster than any cube. Okay? So, so again, let's recap this slide. What does an inverse mean? An inverse has to be defined for a square matrix, right? And that inverse is meaning that we are looking for a matrix that if I multiply in any order with the matrix I'm interested in, I will get the identity matrix, right? So if I do A, B, or B, A, I need to get the identity matrix. So if I am looking for a, a inverse of a square matrix B, uh, which I call A, that means that uh, if I can multiply A in any order by B, get the identity, then I have an inverse for the matrix B. Uh, only square matrices might have inverses, and not all square matrices have inverses. Okay, now why is this uh, important, right? Like, what is the point, you know, of this uh, inverse? Yeah. Uh, so, so what's what's the point of this? Okay. So the the first point of this inverse is that it could be used in order for us to be able to solve a system of linear equations. So let's take a take that step by step. Right, so imagine, yes, you have a system of m linear equations with n variables. So, so you know, like remember when we were in school, we used to take, you know, how do we solve two equations, two unknowns, three equations, three unknowns, right? And so on. Now I'm generalizing that, right? So I am saying, okay, I'm going to have m linear equations with m unknowns, okay? So remember in school, we used to do like, you know, let's say you had uh, two equations to unknowns, you know, you would say x1 plus x2 or x plus y equals three. And then uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, another equation, two x minus three uh, y equals seven or something, right? And now you would get two equations to unknowns, okay? Now, so each equation was a linear equation between the variables of interest, and they were equal to a specific number, right? That's what we used to do uh, when we had, uh, you know, when we had uh, two equations, two unknowns. We had two equations. Each equation was like some linear combination of the variable x and y, or x1 and x2, and they were equal to a specific constant. Now here, I'm just doing the same, right? But I'm just having a more general notation. I am telling you, okay, I have m linear equations with n variables, right? So I have m linear equations. So I have one, two, three, up to m linear equations. And then I have n unknowns, n variables that I am looking for. So each of those equations, if you remember from school, right, we had uh, like x plus y equals something in two equations, right, two unknowns. So now here you will have n of those variables, so x1, x2, up to xn. And you have a linear combination of them, which we titled a11, x1. So that's the first constant multiplied by x1 plus the second constant multiplied by x2 up to the nth constant multiplied by xn equal to some constant b1, right? And then the second equation would be the a21x1 plus a22x2 plus a2nxn equals to b2. The third is a31x1 plus a32x2 plus a3nxn equals to b3. So notice here that uh, a, you know, a is just a constant and the, and here we have uh, n variables, and I'm doing a linear combination of them and setting them equal to a constant, which is b. And I have m of those equations, right? So a m1 x1 plus a m2 x2 plus a m n x n equals b m. So really what this is, if you think about it, is kind of generalization, right, of what we've taken in school. 
So here, uh, what what we have in school, we took like two equations, two unknowns, three equations, uh, three unknowns, or uh, three equations, uh, two unknowns, right? Uh, here, I'm just saying, okay, you know what? I have M equations and N unknowns. So I have M equations and N variables. Each of those equations is just a linear combination of the variables, right? So this, as you see, it's a linear combination of the variables, a a11, x1, a12, x2, up to a1, n, xn is equal to b1. The second equation is also a linear combination of those variables. So you have a21, x1, a22, x2, up to a2, n, xn. And you have m equations, right? So you have a m1, x1 plus am2 x2 up to am n x n equal bm. Cool, right? Now, uh, as you see, the variables we have are x1, <clears throat> x2, up to xn. So these are n variables. In school, we had like two variables, three variables, whatever. Right now, we have n variables. And what we're going to do is we're going to collect all those variables and put them in a column vector. So we're going to take variable x1, variable x2, variable xn, right? And put them in a vector. Of course, it'll be rn. We have n components in that vector. And that's the vector we are looking for. We don't know this vector, right? Because when we want to solve this n, m linear equations with n variables, right? What we are really going to do is we're going to be looking for the components x1, x2 up to xn that satisfy those equations, right? So in school, if we had two variables, two unknowns, if you remember, we were looking for um, uh, for x and y, right, that will satisfy the equations, right, the solution, right, of my uh, 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 linear system, right, of equations. Uh, here, the solution is some vector x, right? So it's a ve it's 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 x array, one D array, which has components x one, x two, up to x n that satisfy those linear equations. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make uh, those in an unknown variable vector. So I'm going to take x one, x two, up to x n, and then make them in a long vector, right? So that's long vector, uh, which is uh, in Rn. Then I'm gonna put the known variables, right, in a uh, in a matrix, right? So I'm gonna take A11, A12, A1n, A21, A22, A2n, A31, A32, A3n, AM1, AM2, AMN, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to list them in a matrix. So this matrix will have M by N, right? So it will have A11, A12, A1N, A21, A22, A2N, AM1, AM2, up to AMN, right? And it will be M by N matrix. So it will have M rows and N columns, OK? And then. Uh, 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 so, 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 yeah, exactly. So, so, what I am doing here now is taking, you know, a one one, a two one, a three one, a m one, putting that as the first column in my matrix, or equivalently, right? I can take a one one, a one two, a one n, make that the first row. The same goes for the second a one two, a two two, a three two, a m two. I'm going to put that as the second column. The same goes for the third a one n, a two n, a three n, a m n, and put that as the last column. Okay, so. So, so we started right with with what we had in school, like two by two, right? Two by two, two equations, two unknowns. And then what we said, okay, is like, can we write that in a more general form? And we said, yeah, we can. We just need instead of two by two, for example, two and two equations, two unknowns. We're gonna read m equations and unknowns, right? So m by n. That that's m equations by n unknowns. And then um, from school, we remember that when we had we were solving linear equations, each uh, equation, right? If we had two variables to announce, right? Each of the equation was a linear combination of the variables, and that was equal to something, to some constant, right? Okay. So here, what we have is the same thing, right? So we started with n equations and unknown, uh, m equations and unknowns. Each equation is linear combination of the variables of interest, which is x1, x2, up to xn. Then what I did is I took the unknown variables, x1, x2, up to xn, I listed them in a, uh, a vector, which is the vector I'm looking for, right? I don't know that, how do I find that yet, but that's what I'm looking for. And then I listed all the knowns, you know, all the known uh, like these that are forming the linear combination, inside that matrix A, 
uh, and those are the known variables. So a11, a12, a1. And so I took the either the first equation, I took its coefficients, right? And then I listed them, or I took the column and then listed it as a column. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same with the vector B, right? So I'm going to take this vector B, B1, B2, B3, up to Bn, and also list that in a vector form. So I have B1, B2, B3 up to Bm, and now that's an m-dimensional vector where I have the coefficients B1, B2 up to Bn. Uh, uh, so these constants, sorry, not coefficients, B1, B2 up to Bn. Okay. So 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 we started from this. Now we define these three components. One is a vector uh, of unknowns and a matrix of the coefficients. Uh, of the linear equations and a vector B of what each linear equation needs to amount to. Now notice that if I have this notation, right? If I have this notation, if I multiply A by X and set that equal to B, I will recover those equations, right? Because now you know how to multiply matrix by vector. Remember, right? You will take the first row, do that inner product with X, then the second row, inner product with X, then the third row, inner product with X, and so on, right? So if you look at AX, you will be doing A11X1 plus, because you're doing inner product of this row by this X. So you get A11X1 plus, A12X2 plus dot, 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 up to A1NXN, which is the first part of this equation. And we set that equal to B. So that's equal to B1. Because when we say equal here, we mean equal component parts. Then you take the second row, which is A21 X2 plus A22 X2 plus dot 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 up to A2 N X N. And that's equal to B2. So what you can, and of course you repeat that for, for you know all the all the rows. So what you can clearly see is that I could rewrite this in a very nice compact form of AX equals B, right? If I define the matrix A to have the coefficients that we took from here, like this column became uh, this, these coefficients, right, became this column, these coefficients became this column, and those coefficients became this column. And then I take the vector X and define that as the vector of unknown variable. Right, And then I take the vector B uh, of what this equate to. And now if I write AX equals B, then I recover this equation. So here's an example for how you would write these notations. Imagine here, I have a three variable, three unknown problem, right? So I have a 2X1 minus 3X2 plus 5X3 equals 2. 6x1 plus x2 minus 7x3 equal minus 3. 5x1 minus 8x2 plus 0.5x3 is equal to 0. So, right? so imagine, <clears throat> imagine you have you know, this, 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 this linear equations, right? So this is a three uh, equations with three unknowns. Okay. I will define my matrix A to be you know, the first two, six, five. I will make that a first column of A. As I you know, explained before, I will take minus 3, 1, and minus 8, make that the second column of A, so minus 3, 1, minus 8. And I'm going to take that 5, minus 7, 0 0.5, and going to make that the third column of A. Then I'm going to make the vector B to be equal to 2, minus 3, 0. And, and of course, my vector X is a vector of X1, X2, X3, as we did here. Now, you can show that if you do A times that vector X, which is made of X1, X2, X3, you will recover B, okay? Okay, now, so by here, like from here, we know how we could write a um, system of linear equations of M variables and unknowns in a matrix vector product. So as you show here, right, or as I described here, you can actually write, you know, the, the this M equation with N unknowns as AX equals to B. Okay, we know that, right? We take X and make that all the variables. We take the coefficients from the linear equations, make those into a matrix, and we take a B vector and make that a vector. Now, the question is, you know, how do you solve this linear equation? you know, AX equals B. Because, because remember, I mean, what's the goal, right? Like if you remember from school as well, the goal was, you know, like to find, 
you know, this x1, x2, up to xn that will satisfy those equations. So now that I have written it in a, in a compact form like this ax equals b, I am really looking for that vector x, you know, that is actually solving this equation. So I'm looking for that vector x because I can modify x. It's the variable of unknowns I'm looking for, right? So I'm looking for that vector x such that if I multiply by that matrix A, I will actually get the B vector. Okay, so I wanna if I wanna solve the, uh, this linear equation, I want to find that variable x here you know, uh, that will make the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side, okay? So given a system of linear equations, ax equals b, how would you solve that? Now, please notice, please be careful here. Many people made this mistake first time we discussed this. Um, you know, in, in standard numbers, you can divide by A, you know, like you just do B by A, right? And then you would get the X, right? Uh, you know, like if you have 2X equals 3, then X will be 3 over 2, right? Um, but when we're, when we're talking about matrices, remember, this is a table of numbers. You cannot just do this division. So you cannot write, oh, x is equal b over a. You know, you need to think how to solve it. So when we say we want to solve this, what we can do, right, is, 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 is we can borrow the idea we discussed from the uh, inverse uh, before. So in order to be able to solve this, we discussed the idea of what an inverse is. But remember, remember, right? So when we talked about the inverses, let's go back to that. We said that the inverses are for a square matrix, right? So, so if I want to apply this idea, right, uh, then I need to have a square matrix. Now, what you say why to apply this idea, okay? Because think about it. Like, let's go back here. Okay. How do I get rid, like, okay, for me to find X, you know, I, I need to get rid of this A matrix, right? So, so if I can get rid of this A matrix from the left-hand side somehow, right, then I will have an equation which says X equal to something, right? So if I can get rid of that matrix, then I am able to uh, uh, do that, right? Like then I am able to, to, to find that variable X that I'm looking for, okay? Imagine A was a square matrix, right? How would you get rid of that? Well, if I can multiply both sides of this equation by the inverse of the matrix that is square, then this side will eliminate this matrix because it will be an identity. Because if I have the inverse of that matrix, let's call that B or A inverse, A to the power minus one, right? So please notice another thing before I continue. When I am writing A to the power minus one, yes? That notation does not mean that I am taking every component in the matrix A and making that power minus one. This is a notation to say it's the inverse, okay? This is the inverse matrix. Yes? Okay, so now so now let's go back to our discussion, right? So, so for me to be able to find that variable X, I need to somehow get rid of that matrix A on the left-hand side of the equation. Now, we know that if there is an inverse matrix, let's call it A inverse, right? and or B, right? Like let's call B, which is equal to A inverse. Again, this doesn't mean you're inverting uh, the components. Then we know that if you multiply A inverse by the matrix A, we will get the identity, right? Because, because we, you know, we, that's what we did before, right? Like uh, in the pre, when we defined the inverse, we said the inverse is that matrix that if you multiply by your matrix of interest, you get the identity. So if I'm able to do that, then I can, try to get rid of this matrix A by multiplying both sides of this equation by the inverse, right? Because if I have A inverse, I multiply that by A, X, and of course I need to multiply it on this side as well. So I will have A inverse, right? A inverse multiplied by B. Now notice that A inverse A is the identity matrix, right? So this is a matrix which will have one, zero everywhere, right? zero, blah, 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 and then one, one on the diagonals, right? And then if you multiply that by the vector x, so which is x1 up to xn, right, you will get nothing but the vector itself, right? So you would get this row by this column, which will be one x1 and zero everywhere. So that's the first component of your resulting vector. Because we multiply the matrix by a vector, we get a vector, previous lecture. Okay, 
And now we will get this vector. So, so now the vector will be the same, which is just x. So now we were able to show that x is equal to a inverse b, right? So, so consequently, if I am solving, you know, for, for x, if I can find that matrix that if I multiply eliminates a from the left-hand side, which is the inverse, then I'm good to go. Okay? But the inverse itself, right, is defined for a, a square matrix, right? Like we only had inverse defined for a square matrix, right? Okay. So first of all, remember what a square matrix means. It means the number of rows is equal to the number of columns. But my matrix A is not a square matrix, right? It doesn't have a square matrix M by N uh, uh, because we had M equations and N unknowns, right? So we had M by N meaning that we had n rows and n columns, okay? So now, given a system of linear equations, Ax equals b, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this somehow, right, into a, a square-looking matrix. So, so what we're going to do first is we're going to multiply both sides by A transpose, right? So I multiply both sides of this equation by A transpose, right? So... Uh, what I have here is I have A transpose A, X, because I multiply both sides by this matrix A transpose. So I have A transpose X, A, A transpose A, X equal A transpose B. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. Remember when we had a matrix A, right? La, 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 whatever. It was made, let's say, of R uh, M by N or M by N, right? Let's call that matrix A. What happens when we transpose that? So here it's M, right? Well, when we transpose that, remember what we get, right? We will get M by M. Yes? Now, if I'm multiplying A transpose A, it means I am multiplying a matrix which is M by M by a matrix which is m by n. I can make this product because those numbers equal. So the number of columns is the same as the number of rows. And now what do I get? I get a matrix which is n by n, which is a square matrix. So if we have a square matrix, then we can actually execute the inverse operator we discussed before. So first of all, I'm going to multiply A transpose on both sides, right? So it's A transpose AX is equal to A transpose B. Why did I do this problem or this product? Because I will get this square matrix. So notice that if I started M by N, now I will have N by N when I do A transpose A. And now all we need to do, right, is we need now to eliminate the A transpose A uh, from the uh, from the uh, left hand side of the equation, in order to eliminate that, if I can find its inverse, right, then this becomes an identity. So if I can multiply by a matrix which is the inverse of a transpose a on both sides of the equation, then I'm able to get the vector x that I'm looking for because now I will eliminate this from my left hand side and I will get x equal to something. <clears throat> so when you do this, uh, when you do this uh, uh, multiplication by the inverse matrix of A transpose A, then you will get the x star, which is going to be A transpose A inverse A transpose B. Okay? Now, now let us go step by step through this just to understand what we have done. Think about it. We understand what AX equals B means. Yes, we, we understand that. We formed that by, by doing what? Well, we formed that by taking the, uh, you know, M equations and unknowns and made a matrix vector product from it. Good. But now, for me to be able to solve for X, I need to get rid of this matrix A from the left-hand side of the equation. So how do I get rid of this matrix A from the left-hand side of the equation? Well, uh, one way to get rid of it is by finding an inverse matrix, because if you multiply the inverse matrix by that matrix on the left-hand side, you will get identity. Right? So, so if you do that multiplication, you will get identity. 
But now we cannot do that inverse for any matrix. It has to be a square matrix. And the A, unfortunately, was not square for us. So what we have done is first we multiplied by A transpose because then we made that square matrix by multiplying by A transpose both sides of this equation. And then what we were able to do, right, is that after we did A transpose A and we multiply both sides, make this a square matrix, now I can eliminate this by multiplying with the inverse. So if I multiply by the inverse of this whole matrix, the square matrix A transpose A, then I can get rid, you know, on the left-hand side of this matrix, meaning that I will have X equal to something. So if now I take, let's call this matrix uh, K matrix, right? Now you have KX is equal to A transpose B, right? Now to find X, you need to get rid of K. How do you get rid of K? Well, if you can multiply by the inverse of K, so let's call that K inverse, Kx is equal to, of course, we need to multiply both sides, which is K inverse A transpose B, right? Now, notice that K inverse K is what? It's identity, because K inverse is the inverse of the matrix K. So here you have identity times X, which is X. So now you will get X is equal, so that's the variable I'm looking for, K inverse A transpose B. But K, K, we define that as A transpose A. So you will get A transpose A inverse A transpose B. Okay? Now, please notice, right, that this is not only, you know, valid if you just multiply by A transpose, right? A transpose, we used it here just to make it, you know, kind of like a... Uh, um, uh, a square matrix, but in fact, you could have uh, you could have uh, uh, multiplied that matrix by any matrix G, such that that G has nice properties you are looking for. So it doesn't have to only be a transpose, but you can actually multiply by G if you're looking for some specific properties. So here, if we have a x equals b, right, then we can multiply G. AX equals GB, and then we can get rid of G and A by multiplying by its inverse, which will give us GA inverse GB. Okay, now we call that G a preconditional matrix. That's what we typically call it, a preconditional matrix. Now, the complexity of the inversion, unfortunately, is order of n cubed. So, you know, to invert this is uh, not easy to do that for big matrices. And what people do in practice is they don't invert the full matrix, but they look at some properties of the matrix, like, you know, like uh, some, how can I exploit the sparsity in my matrix A and so forth. But of course, anytime you actually apply an inversion algorithm, uh, you know, these are kind of optimized inside your code. Okay, so let's just talk about one more thing in this lecture, and that is, you know, an ML application, right? So. Uh, how can we apply, you know, what we discussed before into a, a linear regression problem? So, okay, imagine a linear regression problem, right? So what do you have in a linear regression task? Uh, we are given a data set. That data set is made of input X and output Y, and I have N of those data points. So, you know, I give you a set of data points, which is like x1, you know, some point here, x1, y1, x2, y2, right up to xn, yn. Okay? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we have a linear regression task. We start by, you know, giving you a data set, a data set which is made of, you know, x and y, right? x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xn, yn. And now we're, our goal, right, is to find the model W transpose X that will fit my data, okay? I want to find the model W transpose X that will fit my data. So to find the optimal model parameters, we typically do what? We define, you know, the standard MSE loss, right? So that MSE loss will be the difference between, you know, my Y, the true Y, yeah? And the Y produced by my model, which is W transpose X, right? Okay. Summed 
over all the data points, right? So, so the idea is, <clears throat> depending on W, my W transpose XI will give me some Y, and I will compare that to the real Y, which is YI, and I square that, that's my error, that's my loss, okay? Uh, fine, right? So, so okay, let me just explain one more thing because people might still have been confused, right? Okay, my model, right? So I, my model, the way I write that, I say, okay, I'm looking for my model, which is made of this vector, you know, W1, right? Up to WD, depending on how much dimension my input has, yes? Multiplied by X1 up to XD, right? So my model is this vector W transpose by my X vector, right? So what does that mean? That means, right? That means if you do the inner product, right? We know how to do the inner product. It will be W1 X1 plus W2 X2 plus dot, 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 WD xd right so i take this multiply by that then get this then i add to it the second component multiply with that i get this and to the deep component so notice what i am doing here right so i'm just doing an inner product between two vectors now i don't know w right so my goal in linear regression is to find those w right that will uh, fit my data Right? I will talk about what fit means. But we now understand the model, right? So the model really is a, a straight line in 2D or like a plane in 3D, you know? And it has these unknowns, W1, W2, up to WD. We don't know them, right? And we're gonna try to find them to fit the data we have. Agree? So notice, uh, so notice this is a linear model, right? Like it's the simplest form of model you can have, right? And please notice that when we talk about linear regression, it doesn't mean that we just have linear model in X, we are linear in the weights. So what I mean is instead of the X, I could have also written W transpose times a phi of X, you know, some feature transformation, right? Um, that would still be linear regression because we're linear in the weights. Okay. Right. So that's my, my model. And now to fit my model, Right, what do I do to fit my model, you know? Well, okay, to fit my model, I'm gonna define the error that my model makes on, you know, my training data. So for the point X1, right? So for the point X1, let's say, yeah? Let's say that the real value, yeah, is somewhere here, okay? Like, let's say that's the real value for X1. That's Y of X1, you know, Y1. But my model, yeah, is actually doing this prediction here. So now there is this error between what my model is doing and what the real value is, okay? So what is this value? Well, this value is just evaluating my model on the point x1. So it's really w transpose, you know, times the vector x1. On another point x2, you know, let's say this is the, the, the real value and this is the model value, for example, right? So then, then you will have W transpose X2. That's the prediction of your model, right? Okay. And now, now this is the error the model makes, right? So it's the difference between the real and the predicted thing by the model. And now what I am going to do is I'm going to define the loss to find the right Ws that will minimize my error, okay? So how do I do that? The first thing I am going to do is I'm going to take what my model predicts and what the real value y is, I'm gonna square that, and I'm gonna sum that across all my data points. That's the MSE loss, right? So, so the MSE loss is gonna be summing over all the data, right? The predictions done by the model and the real values of y. Okay? And now I wanna minimize this loss with respect to w, so I wanna start playing with those w's, right? to find that right W that will minimize this MSE loss. Okay. Okay. Now, can we write, you know, this problem in a matrix vector form? Well, 
If I have my data, which is x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xn, yn, I will define two matrices. I will define a matrix, which I call x data, and I will define a vector, which I call y data. So x data is a matrix where the first row is the first data point. The second row is the second data point. The nth row is the nth data point. Fair? Notice my notation. So I use x1 transpose to say that that's my first row. I use my transpose notation because my transpose notation is what's making a column a row vector. So I take the first data point, which is x1. Remember, we are in d-dimensional space. So x1 you know, could be d-dimensional vector, right? Uh, imagine it's about the housing. Uh, you know, it could x1 could be like the uh, something related to the size of the house, the geographic location. So that's already two dimensions, right? And maybe other dimensions. So here we are operating in d-dimensions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take x1 and make that, you know, the first row. We're going to take x2, make that the second row, and we're going to make xn the third, the, the final row. So each of these data points uh, is actually stored in this matrix x1, uh, x data, which is made of the first row x1, x2, up to xn. Then I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to take the y values, y1, y2, up to yn, and actually put them in this vector y data, which is y1, y2, up to yn. So take the first x, make it a row, take the second, and take, of course, the y, make it the first component of the y data vector. The second, make that a row, and y2 becomes the second component here, and then xn, that's the last row, and y1, that's the last component, okay? Now, using our notation, right, using our notation, we could have rewritten, you know, this, uh, uh, this uh, equations, right, of the loss as x data times w minus y data norm of that squared. So, 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 don't worry. Let's go slowly through that. Okay. Remember the norms from the previous lecture, right? So L2 norm squared is the sum of the components of the vector squared. So now x data times w is what? Remember, x data times w. So you have a matrix by a vector. What do you get? You get a vector. Y data is what? It's a vector. So now you have a vector minus a vector. How do you do that? Well, you subtract every component of the vectors. And now we take the norm of that. Right, so the norm of that squared right will be uh, uh, this error uh, and loss. Why that's the case, right? Please try to show that right in the exercise, but it's not uh, hard to do that. All you need to do to show that those two are equal, think about it. You will take x data, and you will multiply that by the vector w, right? So x data by the vector w, you will need to multiply this matrix by the vector. So you'll take that by w, that by w, that by w, right? So, so row, row by the column, row by the column, and so on, right? So row by the column, right? So you'll have x1 transpose times w. Then you have x2 transpose times w, right? Now, notice in our notation is W transpose X. Are those equal? Well, think about it, right? So, you know, uh, uh, think about why W transpose X is the same as X transpose W, right? So now when we do X times W, right, we will get this vector made of those, yes? And we subtract from that what? We subtract from that this vector, Y1, Y2, up to Yn, right? So you'll have x1 transpose w minus y1 as the first component, x transpose, x transpose 2w minus y2, right? And then from that, what do you do, right? We need to take the norm squared. What does the norm squared mean? You sum every component of the resulting vector squared, right? So we're kind of getting close to this. Okay. I'm not going to solve it for you, but the I think the hints are kind of useful, right? So 
you know, x times w will give me a vector where it's x transpose w, x1 transpose w, x2 transpose w, and so on. Then you subtract that from y, meaning every component, and you take the norm, so which is the sum of every component squared. So we're almost there, right? Okay. Okay. And now, if you actually want to solve, you know, this system of equations, then you can actually show <coughs> that the uh, that the solution, you know, W star, will be satisfying the following system of linear equations: x data transpose x data W star is equal to x transpose data y, and now you can do the inverse. Why that's the case? Okay, we need to go to a bit of gradients, right, or derivatives because we want to minimize this loss, right, to understand that. But the idea is that once you do those gradients, you will actually arrive at a system that looks like this. Uh, you can show it, you know, if you look at derivatives here, but don't worry if you don't know how to prove it yet, because, because that's going to come, you know, when we start talking about calculus later on, right? Uh, but now the idea is that at least, you know, we can rewrite this linear regression kind of problem, yeah, in a matrix vector form, and then we can show if we knew gradients that, you know, you will need to solve this system of equations, right, for us to be able to find that W star. Okay, good. So with this, I think I would like to end uh, this uh, relatively long uh, lecture. Uh, next time, we're going to be discussing eigenvalues. Uh, but uh, uh, and eigenvectors. Uh, and then after that, we're going to be discussing some properties of matrices. And then we finish matrices and then jump into calculus, where we're going to talk about derivatives, back propagation, and so on. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you. And, uh, and I am really uh, grateful for the feedbacks I'm getting. Uh, please uh, feel free to subscribe and like and share the video if you find it useful. And I will see you next time when we talk about eigenvectors. Okay, thanks a lot.